And again, welcome to all. My name is Andrew Hone, President and CEO of the Portland Business Alliance, Greater Portland's Chamber of Commerce. Thank you so much for joining us today for our October video forum. Everyone here at the Alliance hopes you're doing well. While our region continues to navigate the COVID-19 pandemic, we encourage everyone to practice physical distancing and help all of us contain this virus by wearing your mask. During COVID-19 closures, we continue to work diligently to be a resource to all of you and our community. Our website is updated frequently. And you can follow us on social media for updates. And you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and elsewhere. And there it is. Look how amazing. A recording of this presentation and links for resources mentioned will be available on our website later today. Of course, none of these events could happen without the support of our members, all of you. I'd like to introduce our board chair, uh, our direct, excuse me, our chair of our board of directors for the Portland Business Alliance, Mike Golub, president of business with the Portland Timbers and Thorns. Mike, welcome. Thank you, Andrew, and welcome everybody to this month's video forum. Uh, we have a great audience today and a, and a great group of panelists, so uh, welcome. First, I want to uh, thank our terrific sponsors who made today possible, Key Bank and the Portland Tribune, and I'd like to introduce the Oregon Market President of Key Bank, Michelle Weisenbach. Welcome, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. I'm so delighted to be here. Good morning, I'm Michelle Weisenbach, I'm the president of KeyBank here in Oregon and Southwest Washington. And I want to thank all of you for joining us in a what has become a norm of a virtual meeting. Um, I know that I am personally really looking forward to hearing from our panelists today about, you know, kind of the future of work and what it means from all of us that are, you know, contemplating going back into the office um, as we have continued to work from home. You know, one of the things I'm, I'm pretty sure of is we move into um, the realities of getting back into the office is that getting dressed in the morning will be a different uh, challenge. I won't just have to pick out my favorite Zoom top. I'm also going to have to figure out, you know, what kind of shoes I actually put on. So um, I know we're all thinking about that ourselves. Um, one of the things that I have been really pleased about is just how our teams have navigated, you know, the, the transition to work working from home when i think about my team members here at key bank you know when we first started uh, working remotely one of the challenges that we were thrown into is how do we deliver upon the paycheck protection program um, you know virtually to our clients and my financial services partners were doing the same and, and we put millions of dollars into the state of oregon through that program and that, but we've had to then transition and thinking about how we conduct financial wellness um, reviews with clients that are thinking about their personal finance, financials in a pandemic and how do we do that in a meaningful way virtually. But now we're starting to think about what does it mean to go back into the office and how does that feel to be back in that environment and the collaboration that comes from being in the office together. And so we're excited about that, but we also recognize that the work is likely not gonna be a five days a week, you know, in at eight, out at five, kind of an environment. And so really interested today to figure out, you know, what does that mean? So we're gonna leave the details to our esteemed panel as they help us dive deeper into the subject of what does the world of work look like going forward? But I want to, um, you know, thank the Portland Business Alliance for, um, helping us pull this esteemed group of experts together for all of us here joining today and just excited to see how we think about what the world of work looks like going forward and really proud that KeyBank is able to help sponsor this event today. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, Michelle. And I uh, wanted to also uh, reiterate our thanks to the Portland Tribune. They're not able to join us today, but I wanted to share a few remarks on their behalf the Portland Tribune and the Pamphlet Media Group have been sponsoring PBA's monthly forum for more than 10 years because these discussions are so critical to the community. Uh, their belief is that quality journalism helps to build stronger communities. And like all businesses, Pamphlet Media Group's 25 newspapers and websites have taken a big economic hit during the pandemic. But at the same time, they're seeing a lot more interest and a lot more engagement in journalism since 
COVID hit in March, web traffic for the Tribune has more than doubled as people are seeking credible local inf information to help them navigate through these times. Uh, they've also been working hard to help other businesses market their services and products. Uh, they've been offering matching grants for advertising, and they've seen a very strong response to that program. So thank you again, uh, Portland Tribune and Pam Blinn. Uh, today we've got a, a great group of four individuals. Um, we know you're going to have questions, so a few little housekeeping to start. Please uh, submit your question by using the Q&A tool that you'll find at the bottom of your Zoom window. That's the, that's the only way we're going to be taking questions today. And when you do submit your question, please include your full name, your organization, and the location of your business. If you have an, uh, a comment at any time, please feel free to enter those in the chat function. And now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Joining us today is Vanessa Sturgeon, President and CEO of TMT Development. Vanessa, Amanda Howell, the Project Manager with Urbanism Next at the University of Oregon. Andrew Colas, President and CEO of Colas Construction. And finally, Matt Newstrom, who's a principal at Hyphen. Welcome everyone. And today our four panelists are going to engage in a discussion on what's next for the future of work in post pandemic Portland. So thank you all for being here and, and join me in welcoming our panelists, please. Sorry, unmute Zoom call. Um, thanks, Mike. Let's go around and share a little more about what we do, and I will start. I'm Vanessa Sturgeon, President and CEO of TMT Development. Um, I'm also the Chair Emeritus of the Portland Business Alliance. Um, TMT Development owns and manages um, six and a half million square feet of real estate, including quite a bit of downtown real estate um, in Portland. Amanda, you'd like thanks. to introduce yourself. Thanks, Vanessa, and thanks uh, for, to the Portland Business Alliance for having me on this panel. I'm very glad to be participating in this discussion today. Uh, I am Amanda Howell, as mentioned. I'm a project manager and researcher with the Urbanism Next Center at the University of Oregon, based in Portland, not in Eugene. We, the research that we focus on looks at the impacts of emerging transportation technologies and e-commerce on cities and what that means for the future um, for land use, transportation, urban design, the economy, um, kind of looking at it holistically and across the board. My particular areas of uh, research expertise are on really on the Im impacts of e-commerce on cities. And so my current research agenda, especially related to COVID, is looking at what the impacts are of um, delivery on cities and the extent to which we're seeing accelerated trends with grocery and food delivery, as well as packages. Um, so that's, but also just the future of work and how all of these things come together. So broad, lots of things to chat about. Ah, thank you, Amanda. Um, Andrew Colas, if you could introduce yourself. Thanks, Vanessa. I'm Andrew Colas. I'm president and CEO of Colas Construction. We're a local general contractor. We do a lot of commercial general contracting work, second generation family owned business. So we do everything from K through 12 to housing to civic buildings, uh, the, the whole array. So I'm happy to be here and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Matt. Unmute. So I'm Matt Newstrom, and I put a belt and button up shirt on today. So that was an achievement, not the Lulu's as was mentioned before. Uh, I'm co owner and principal of uh, consulting at Hyphen, and Hyphen is a workplace services integrator. So we look at people, places, and technology. Uh, over the last seven months, you know, pre COVID, we were really looking at utilization and different occupancy strategies. But since uh, COVID hit, this has really accelerated what we're doing. So we are living and breathing this and excited to talk about this today. Thank you, Matt, and thanks everyone. Okay, I will start with our first question. This one is for Andrew and Matt. 
Since March, about 35% of the U.S. workforce has switched to telecommuting due to the pandemic. Here in our region, work from home guidelines remain in place, with little sign that we'll be entering phase two reopening in the near future. That's more than six months now of working from home for thousands of employers. Our recent report shows that after months of living on video, the novelty has worn off for many workers. The vast majority of us, 88 to 90 percent, depending on the study, want to work in the office again. Let's start by talking about how the pandemic has impacted your short-term working conditions and projects. And Andrew, we'll start with you. Thanks, Vanessa. So uh, when, when everything first happened and the shutdown occurred, uh, we're, we're, in, we're a construction business, so we're, we're, we were considered an essential business. So the, the good and bad of that, the good side of it meant that we still had work. Um, and we're very fortunate to have that work because we have a lot of great people that we employ that, that need the work. The, the bad part about it, or the concerning part initially, was just the safety concerns. So initially, uh, as you can imagine in the construction industry, it, it does take multiple people to build, build these projects. And a lot of times you're working together to get the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. So uh, we had to go into a really critical kind of uh, uh, a download of, of what we had to do to make sure our people were safe. That was the most important aspect of it. So uh, at the, as you can all imagine, initially when this happened, it was hard to get PPE equipment, masks, other elements that could would allow us to keep keep our employees safe. So we had to really go into creative ways to, to find those resources. One of the creative ways was one of our top technicians uh, started using our 3D printers to, to print out face masks so that everybody on our project teams could have access to that and could be safe. Um, and then the other elements were just putting a plan, a safety plan in place to make sure that we could uh, do the work that we needed to do in a safe, uh, in a safe fashion, while also um, maintaining the, the necessary uh, safety guidelines as far as the six foot uh, distance spread of everybody, um, we had invested a lot in technology in regards to uh, mobile community uh, commuting. So we were very fortunate to be a little ahead of that. Uh, a lot of our projects they're large scale, so we almost have remote offices. So we really wanted to invest in the technology to be able to bring everybody together, even when they were oper operating remotely. So that, that's something that we were able to adapt and adjust to pretty easily. We were really lucky as far as that aspect of it went. But then also the, the other aspect that you had to deal with uh, in regards to the initial concerns of, of, of the pandemic were we had some employees that preferred not to be on site. Uh, that some of the benefit packages that they were able to get with the $600 and uh, being able to get unemployment, some people chose to take that, which we understood. So we also had to adjust um, in being able to continue to deliver uh, our projects and the excellence that that our owners and uh, development groups have, have learned to expect from us. So it was a lot of different uh, moving parts and management, uh, but I, I'm really proud of the work that our teams have done and now here we are six months into it and you know normally we're having check-in meetings with our teams there's obviously as, as we all can imagine a lot of zoom meetings and and to your point uh, in the beginning of the question vanessa I, I i do see it being something that people are looking forward to getting back to having certain meetings and we've been able to uh clearly in construction you have to have certain physical meetings so we've just been putting more and more guidelines in place to allow for um, meetings with uh, more of our groups. Usually they're outdoor. That's, we found that that's safer. Um, so it's a, it's a lot of adjustment and adapting to the current situations. Um, and, and then the next kind of level that is looking at as over the next year, what we're gonna do to continue to adapt and, and find ways to really get people back to being able to work in 3D and, and, and doing that safely. So there's a lot of different adjustments that we've made and, uh, and we've, we've been really lucky and fortunate. We haven't had any COVID breakouts at any of our, our project sites uh, to date. And uh, we feel really good about that. Matt? Yeah, so we were watching COVID unfold and uh, back in probably early February, uh, our IT director said, we need to do a work from home assessment. And at first I was thinking, this is over there. It's not here. 
uh, but let's do it anyways. And we did a survey with our team and we learned that about 95% of our workforce was ready just to pick up. If we had to say, close the office tomorrow, they were ready to go. So we felt good about that. And we didn't still at that point know that we were gonna have to exercise that. So come March, when we had to flip the switch, we were able to walk away from the office uh, being that one of our major services is contract uh, commercial furnishings, we were, wanted to make sure that all of our employees were supported at home. Um, I have an office at home. Doesn't mean all of our employees do. So we got task chairs, desks, monitor arms, things like that, just to make sure that people were supported properly. Um, the uh, one of the main things, uh, or excuse me, third of our workforce is in the field, similar, similar to Andrew. So. We had a team that had to focus on what is our work from home guidelines? What are the tools we need there? And then we have crews that are out on construction fields, uh, actually some of them working with Colas. And what are our protocols? We had to move fast to make sure that we were making uh, people feel safe and our employees felt safe. Uh, we didn't want there to be the haves and have nots of our office team that could work from home and then our team that was out in the field. And so constant communications about what's rationale behind our new protocols. Why are we still working in the field? What are the safety guidelines that we're uh, going to implement? Those were things that we really focused on. Um, since we are working with teams and companies on workplace strategy already, we had a, um, the, our projects were interesting because we had a number of large projects, they stayed, and there was a number of small ones that just completely collapsed because people were panicking about what do we do uh, so we felt that we were prepared to have those conversations even before you know we knew much about COVID so it uh, created a dynamic that was a very wild ride where there's a lot of inquiries we're doing research like mad we're trying to figure out what the answers are we're trying to take care of our teams uh, then in Michigan they had a full closed shutdown and that's where our major manufacturer is so we had six weeks where we had we couldn't install products for our companies, we couldn't place orders, we, there was no clarity, it was a complete log jam. Uh, so wild ride is an understatement and I'm glad that is behind us um, and we're optimistic looking forward. You know, we truly believe that um, you know, we've had a great test here. People can work from home. I think it's proven out that this is not the total solution and we'll talk about that more throughout the day today. Thanks, Andrew and Matt. It's great to hear what your experiences have been like so far with the work that you're doing. I will take this next question. This one is for Vanessa, and then I think uh, Matt and Andrew can follow after Vanessa answers. So part of our work at Urbanism Next is predicting what's next for land use needs, transportation, and urban design. For the business leaders on the panel today, I'm, I'm really curious. Let's talk about how the current conditions are defining your long-term business strategies how are you rethinking new projects with new designs? Uh, I think, yeah, Vanessa, if you can start. Thanks, Amanda. So six months ago, my answer to this question would have been different because I think that at that time, a lot more companies thought that they were going to be able to have a lot more employees stay at home for the long term, particularly tech companies. And as this pandemic has unfolded and gone on for a very long time, um, we're finding, like the survey that Andrew referenced in his introduction, that um, for most people, it's not working all that well. So while it's possible and maybe a hybrid model might work, it's really impacting company culture. And in particular, it's really impacting the career and development of millennials who really need that mentorship of the, the office environment that they're just not getting at this time. So. Um, what I would have said six months ago is that we're, we're gonna see quite a bit um, of a shrink in the need for office space. Um, that evolved to tech companies saying, maybe they'll work from home. And then the more standard tenants saying, you know, we wanna actually expand the amount of space we have so we can be permanently socially distanced. So we thought there might be some sort of a wash there. And now we're seeing that tech companies who had said they weren't going to renew their leases are, are in the process of doing full renewals of all of their space. So I think that it really just remains to be seen. Um, what has become very clear 
is that building systems are now going to be on tenants lists of questions they ask when they sign leases and they're going to want to know how airflow works and how your filtration systems work and um, so I've never had more questions pop up about that from existing tenants and it's it's going to be one of those things that's across the board for example um, lead or green um, is now just an expectation and I think that building filtration is also going to be just an expectation yeah so we've been working on a few business lines pre-covid uh, we didn't know that they were actually going to uh, be service lines that would see a lot of demand I remember the first month in someone called me and said great pivot and I'm like no it's been a year in the in the works but really it was us at hyphen looking at you know even pre-covid if you look at research 60 percent of offices are occupied at any one time um, and we've been trying to work with organizations to say there's probably a value that we can extract out of changing the way that your your work models uh, are so we've been working on that as a consulting line and then once we got to covid um, everyone's asking about it the the other thing that we are working on uh, is technology so uh, we used to be known as an office furnishings company, but there, that's not enough anymore. So we're trying to provide holistic solutions, uh, including Zoom licenses, uh, video conferencing systems, network cabling, sound masking. How does your office work work together? So what COVID did was actually galvanize the strategies that we put in place, and we're going to double down on those. Uh, really thinking going forward, I agree with Vanessa, uh, space is going to shrink a little bit. Uh, me personally, I'm going to be working from home probably two days a week, even when we can come back. Uh, I like skipping the commute. I can get some good focus work done, but it's also nice to be in the office. You know, what research is showing is uh, we're losing collaboration. You know, uh, people need to collaborate. They need to socialize in the office. And you can't replicate that through this, this interaction. So, uh, agree with Vanessa. I think there's going to be a, a, a tightening of the space, um, but it, it's it's not going to go away. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add add to that. Um, for for a business like the construction industry, or you can imagine a lot of the businesses that we work with, architects, engineers, a lot of the consultants that we constantly are relying upon, uh, being in the office. Um, is such a critical element to to a business like us like ours we've adapted well and and i think that there will be aspects as the world opens back up that we'll utilize uh, specifically in regards to our, our more remote offices it allows us to have that level of collaboration with our teams but one of the criti critical elements of the construction industry and I, I think the same goes for a lot of industries as you can imagine like accounting or other industries is the collaboration, but then just the inheritance that you gain from being in an office. So when you're able to hear a conversation about, you know, best practices or a lesson learned or, or different ways that you can approach clients, it's really hard to overhear conversations as on Zoom because the whole point of Zoom, as, as we all know right now, is it's focused conversations. So you're not, you're not having uh, conversations, uh, that are not pertaining to whatever reason that you're, you're logged into Zoom. So I think that's a really critical element to the growth in companies. And then as you're onboarding, onboarding people, and Vanessa mentioned this, it's just about the growth. Um, so a lot of the younger people that are coming into industry, you learn the majority of the knowledge uh, from the industry that we're in, from being around the people that have the experience. And while you, you can, you can uh, utilize technology to, help um, bring that forward. Simple things like understanding the different ways that people interact and their personalities, that's really important. Uh, I have a pretty sarcastic sense of humor uh, and it doesn't always play well on Zoom, right? Like people don't know that, oh, that was a joke because I don't really get a look into your eyes to make it clear like, oh, that, that was a joke. Uh, so it's hard for me when my jokes fall because um, usually I think they're really good, but on Zoom, they're, they're just not as good. So it's those little elements that you learn about people and, and the way they interact and the way uh, to encourage them, the way to manage, the way to help people grow. Uh, it's, it's a lot more difficult in Zoom, but so I, I think it'll, it will be a hybrid. For, for, for our um, needs, 
we don't see decrease in office space. Uh, it's, it's more to what Vanessa talked about, um, looking at how do we have uh, more uh, spaces that are closed. So it really means that we, we need actually more space and we want to invest in that. We want to make it comfortable and safe in case there are pandemics or anything else in the future. Um, but that element of, of personal connection, you, you realize how important it is and, and how much people value it. Uh, when, when you're not able to have it over the last six months. So I think we're, we're all learning a lot about how to navigate and operate our businesses. Um, so great, great round of question. And that leads to our next question uh, that I'm going to ask Amanda. So um, as your team study new developments and research on how COVID-19 has affected urban design, what's top of mind for new approaches? Thinking specifically around commute patterns today and future of transportation investments, as well as possible new approaches such as buildings or other infrastructure design. Amanda? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. Um, I, I think as I was thinking about this question earlier, I feel like the, the two things that I, I that really feel like they really come to mind as I think about all the different things that we've been seeing and trends that have started to develop over the last six months is, you know, I think a flexibility is absolutely key and, I, and I'll kind of talk through, I think, what that means in terms of transportation and, and infrastructure design as well. Um, but the other piece I would say is really that it feels like I, th I think we've really seen a lot of accelerated trends. So things that were happening before have really just taken off in the last six months as a result of the pandemic. Um, I, I think just thinking about what the future of work looks like from the standpoint of you know, are we returning to the office? Um, I think, as the other panelists have referenced, you know, I think that there's kind of a mixed bag in terms of to the extent that people are ready to return and, and but that there's definitely a desire on the part of many to go back, that there is the need for collaboration in person and that innovation that comes from being able to be in person. I do think that we'll see, you know, I think remote work will augment being back in the office. I, I, I don't see us necessarily returning to the way that things were before, where we were primarily in the office five days a week, all at the same time. I think that you know, a, lot of, a lot of people have come to enjoy um, having more flexibility in their schedules. As Matt mentioned, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of us are happy to skip the commute time and take that time back for ourselves. So walking across the hall is a is a much shorter commute than than getting downtown or wherever you have to go. So I think I think it's going to be augmented for sure from with remote work. I think some things that we might see from transportation patterns with with some folks working more from home and some days or you know only going to the office a few days is more staggered commutes, um, which. You know, I think that has a lot of benefits as well in, in many ways, both like, you know, not spending time stuck in traffic, but from an environmental standpoint, we've seen some really positive impacts from the fact that we have spent, been spending less time in, in cars and commuting and being, you know, having the congestion factor. So I think that there's some really important environmental benefits that we can capitalize on with all of this. Um, you know, bike sales have been way up since the, since the start of the pandem pandemic. People are buying bicycles. Um, you know, uh, Piwa, just the bike town, now we have the e-bikes, those are becoming, you know, really hugely popular. So I think, you know, I, th I think people are, are not comfortable being in transit, which is understandable. So I, you know, not wanting to be in enclosed spaces, although I would say, I think it's important to note that so far we haven't seen any, um, there's not really evidence of widespread transmission on transit, but there's the discomfort of wanting to be on transit. So I think, you know, m making space in our infrastructure, and again, this is, I think, where it comes to the fact that, you know, we, we were moving towards this from an infrastructure design perspective, this idea of need for adaptability and flexibility. So using our streets in more flexible ways, thinking, making sure that we're, we are making safe space for um, bikes and other micromobility users, designing space so that there is, you know, we might have transit priority at some times of the day, maybe not others necessarily. We also need to have, I think, you know, we've been starting to see on the transportation side, this huge shift towards the need for flexible curb space. The idea that like, it can't just be kind of parking all the time. We need to make space now for the fact that there is, um, you know, I think passenger, the use of Uber and Lyft, while it did definitely precipitously fall off, I think we're starting to see that return. So we need space for that. 
We definitely need space for the increased deliveries. So I think that, you know, thinking about flexible, adaptable space that can change and shift as the, you know, based on the time of day and also the day of the week, I think that's going to be really important as we move into the future. Um, I also think that this also applies to building spaces as well. We think we kind of need to think about flexible building spaces. Um, you know, I, I don't, I mean, I'm curious how the other panelists, what, you know, with your expertise being and, you know, being more in the business world, but it feels like some of the things that I'm seeing is this idea that we would move in some ways towards kind of more of a we work model where there's, you know, maybe, maybe we don't have set desk spaces that when we go into the same, you know, every time we go into the office that we're not going to go into the same place. Um, I have spent just a little bit of time in some tech companies in the Bay Area, just being in some of those spaces. And, you know, I think there's, I, I remember being in one of them and it was like a bunch of people just kind of hanging out on couches, working on laptops or, every, you know, no one really had dedicated workspace. They just moved around depending on what, you know, if they were meeting or um, what they were doing during the day. So, you know, is that possibly something that we're going to, to do for the future and see more of? Uh, the other thing I think from a building design perspective that I'm thinking a lot about with just the research in particular that I'm working on is this need for accommodation of deliveries. Um, I, that is not going away. I, I definitely don't think that's going away. And so I think we need to think about, you know, as we, as we build new buildings and, and how they interface with the street and where those deliveries are, are coming to and having space in the building to accommodate, um, I think that's gonna be really important. Definitely also, like I think the idea that you know, we're seeing this blurred line start to happen between like freight and commercial space as well. So, you know, whereas before places um, maybe only, uh, uh, you know, you might, you might go in and just buy something in the store. Now there, these spaces are really, everything's kind of omni-channel retail. So I think this idea as well that, you know, places aren't necessarily going to be like dedicated retail. I think it's also going to be more about having flexibility there as well and sort of, you know, having space from a warehousing standpoint. That was a lot of things. So I will uh, pass it along to Matt to, to see what he says about this. So this question made me think about an article I read on uh, Fast Company the other day. It was called Zoom Towns, and maybe I can put it in the chat. It was very interesting in thinking about uh, their thing was, now that we're in this pandemic, majority of people are working from home. People are thinking about, hey, where do I want to live? And it talked about Sandpoint, Idaho, the lake in the summer, uh, slopes in the, in the winter and they're just getting hammered by people coming in because they're not tethered to a, a desk anymore. Uh, so I'm not sure if that's a, a trend, if that's going to be a, a, a long term, but that was really interesting. Um, and on a related topic, I was reading a article from um, a local brokerage firm here in Portland and I was talking about just how the lease, the transactions in the CBD have basically stopped. Um, but we're seeing some more activity in the suburbs. So uh, more flexibility, you know, again, is it going to be everyone working from home all the time? Uh, no, but I could tell you personally, I would rather go from where I live you know, 10 minutes down the road to the office three days a week versus where I have to drive where my, in, to Northeast Portland where I'm at just due to the commute time. Uh, as far as buildings and uh, trends within the buildings, I agree with Amanda, flexibility is going to be key um, but before we can be flexible we have to understand how people are using space so uh, we do space analytics uh, there's systems that you can install permanently and it's basically like your electrical meter you know how much space are you using and where are you using it at and that technology was really uh, getting steam before we went into covid now it doesn't make sense to measure space because no one's there uh, but as people start to come back it'll be interesting you know how are we validating safety in the space as you're, you know, if you're starting to occupy during COVID, how are we validating that uh, we're not overstaffing the floors? Um, once you have that data in a post-COVID world, you know, really flexibility with lease terms, I think is gonna change. Um, if we, if you know that, hey, we're only using our space 50% of the time by the numbers, that allows us to work with our, our uh, customers to say, is there a different occupancy strategy so you can either use less space or you can hire more without taking more? Um, and the other thing about, I think about offices is, you know, there's been a trend in Portland that started with tech firms, which is 
uh, cool space, make sure that the culture is uh, apparent in the space. But I think that it's really going to challenge some companies that have uninviting space. You know, there's still the Dilbert cube farms out there. Um, looks like you're going into the DMV office. Those places, you know, uh, people are going to choose to work from home rather than come in, even if they're missing out on collaboration. So how do you make space a destination? I think it's going to be a challenge for, um, you know, occup occup occupiers of space. Um, and how do you instill that culture into your or branding into your space. Uh, people are going to come back from the office being a little bit disconnected, I think, just due to, like Andrew was saying, you know, you can only have so much collaboration, you're going to miss out on the great funny jokes by Zoom. Um, but how do you bring people back into the office and up to speed as fast as possible so you can rebuild and, you know, make sure your company is um, as productive as possible. Uh, the last thought on my mind, and Vanessa would welcome your thoughts on this, is we are talking to uh, some local landlords about spec suites. So, to Amanda, your point about WeWork, I'm not sure if it's going to go fully that way where um, everything is fully unassigned. It, it, it might, uh, but working with a couple of landlords that they believe there's going to be pent up demand and people are going to, right now, no one wants to make a decision because we don't know what's happening. Um, but unfortunately, decisions do need to be made with lease expirations. So once we come back to the office, there's uh, speculation that people aren't going to be prepared to wait for, um, you know, 90 days to, to negotiate a lease, 90 days to build it and fit it out and then and move. And so we're actually working with uh, a couple on let's fully furnish it, furnish it. So all they have to do is just move into the space. Um, you know, the, the cost that they put into furniture and cabling and things like that can be included in the lease, and then you can do shorter term deals. So, you know, I think the, uh, the days of 10 year leases might be behind us. Uh, personally, knowing what I pay for my design studio per month, it hurts every day when I <laughs> sit down at my desk at home and, and know what I'm you know, paying there. So, I think those are some changes that I, I would expect. Well, Matt, that's interesting that you should say that because we're actually building out three floors of the studio building, just like you you mentioned, fully specced suites with furniture to accommodate for people that have pent up demand and have lease expirations coming up and um, maybe don't want to be in 8,000 feet, but for sure we'll take four. So um, as long as it's ready to go. One of the interesting things about um, about the technology is that, again, people are so interested in things like backup generators now to make sure that there are no issues while the buildings are uh, less occupied, that their, their entire IT backbone and infrastructure is up and running. And then, of course, the HVAC question, which is, is the air recycled? How is it filtered? And every building does it a little bit differently. So people really want to know where does your air come from and where does it go? Uh, Fox Tower and Park Avenue West are newer systems and we invested in the best technology when we built both of them and they can be switched. So they, they are fully open loop. So those systems can go to fully open so the air isn't recycled at all. Um, and what's interesting now, and I guess not really surprising when you think about it, is that there are studies that have come out really recently that have been referenced by Dr. Burks that show that COVID really isn't spreading like we thought it would at the workplace. People are being careful, they're being thoughtful, they're spreading out, they're wearing masks, um, and probably most relevant is that they're not drinking during this time. Um, the spread is really looking like um, it's oftentimes tied to house parties. And that, that, that is, that's the number one way it looks like it's being spread. And of course, you know, people let their guard down when they have a glass of wine and, and um, those seem to be where the super spreader events are, are happening. So interesting, um, interesting change in times for the moment. I guess it's been fascinating to watch the arc of knowing so little at the beginning and knowing so much more now, six months later. Yeah. All right. Oh, sorry, Andrew. Oh, you, you, did you have the next question? 
I think so. But go for it. I'm going to ask the one in front of me. Okay. Sorry if I'm stepping out. Uh, so this is for uh, Vanessa and Andrew. So many of us are looking to technology and how it supports the hybrid work environment. I'd like to hear from you, uh, for those of you focused on building management and development on how you're approaching this in current infrastructure, as well as new construction. With regard to new construction, we're really just, for the moment, settling on, on waiting to see how things roll out over the next, um, you know, however many months that it takes to get some positive net absorption. But with regard to technology, again, it, it all comes down to those building systems and things change so rapidly in that area. And one really interesting thing that happened is that ionizers, which a lot of us have at our homes for our systems became widely available for buildings. So buildings that don't have those open loops have ionizers now, um, and they're very inexpensive, $500 per VAB box. Um, and there are a lot of VAB boxes in a large building, but that, that kill 99.6% of COVID bacteria. And those are the same systems that you're seeing be installed on airplanes as well. So the air that you're breathing as it's recycled is being cleaned, um, which, you know, again, who would have known that people would be so very interested in, in that? But the, the industries have adapted and are very quickly gearing up to install those functions. Most buildings already have done something like it at this point. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's, there, there are a lot of things that we're looking at in regards to technology on some of the new buildings that were, were in the midst of pricing. Um, but, you know, as far as video conferencing, I think that it, it's been important, but it will continue to be more important as far as the way you set up conference rooms and having the ability to do a video conference with multiple people at a table and you still have a distance uh, to, to make sure that you're maintaining a, a, a safe space from each other. But one of the things that I, I think that Amanda kind of talked on is just some of the projects that we're looking at as far as uh, the commercial kitchen hubs. So you're gonna see a lot more um, um, businesses and restaurants move to a more hub type uh, approach where you have multiple restaurants in one hub where you have the shared, you know, oven space and all, all the needs to actually provide the food for the Postmates of the world and the Uber Eats of the world. So you're coming, you're going, you're picking up and you're delivering. So I think you'll see um, more of that. And then, you know, one of the last things that I think it's going to be critical to to cities and states that that want to really uh, come out on the other side of this in, in, a, in a strong manner is city planners being able to adapt and adjust in a timely basis. So in in our region, you already had an affordability issue. Um, obviously, we're more affordable than some of our uh, sister cities as far as Seattle or San Francisco. But with the with the uh, wave of people being able to work remotely you're seeing more and more people come to our region, which we already had happening. So it's gonna be really critical for our city planners to make adjustments. So let's say it's a mixed use building. It's gonna be a lot more difficult for developers to be able to tenant those out. So we need to have flexibility as far as what the demands of retail space are gonna be, because we all know that's gonna change as technology changes the way that we actually uh, commerce. Um, so really new grocery stores, do you need as much parking space as, as you did in the past? Um, a lot of those zoning conditions and chaining changes are gonna be really critical to maintaining affordability in cities. So I, I think it's really gonna come down to the city planners that are able to move ahead of that and think about what it's gonna look like five and 10 years from now so that they can help developers that are willing to take the risks. Because really it comes down to that. Uh, a lot of times to make that shift, you have to have developers that are willing to take the risk and say, okay, I'm gonna go with less parking than I know we typically have, but I'm gonna take that gamble. And that, that gamble is up to them. A lot of times city planners don't allow those developers to do it. And by not allowing that to happen, what happens is, you're not maximizing uh, the, the land and, and the affordability of that land, in turn increasing the cost of all the land around you. 
So I think if we want to be able to come out of this in a, in a good place and, and still be that city that people want to be a part of and that still has the affordability, our city planners are really going to have to be able to adjust and to modify in a really timely and, and, and fast manner so that we as the industry can respond in turn keeping the affordability of, of the city. And, and I think that's a really critical element that, that I'm hopeful that, that our city planners and, and the people that are really responsible for that seek and, and seek knowledge from people like Amanda so that we can maintain that. Uh, and that's going to be really critical. And great comments, Andrew. Government known for being able to pivot on a dime, <laughs> adapt. Um, do we have any other comments from the panelists before we um, are joined by Andrew Hone for questions from the audience? I'm happy to tell a joke if anybody wants to. <laughs> yeah, I want to see how your material is. Yeah, Let's hear it. jokes are good. Even on Zoom, Andrew. Well, thank you to all of you for your insight. Um, I'd now like to welcome Andrew Hone back to ask some questions on behalf of our audience. Thank you, Vanessa, and to our panelists. And of course, I think one of the key takeaways that I had from this is, is always, Vanessa brings such an interesting um, perspective. Don't drink in the workplace is key to not spreading COVID. I couldn't agree more. I want to reiterate that strongly to our audience. Please stay away from the booze when you're in your workplace. Okay, so uh, I'm going to tee up a, um, a few questions here. They're a great uh, uh, play here in the q and I'm gonna start a little bit out of order with two that I think are very synced up here. And I wanna give a shout out to the folks that were an uh, asking them. I'm gonna place them together. So the first comes from Trisha Riley of the OSU Foundation and Nikki Jordan with Northwest Natural. And I'll, I'll sort of tell you why, because I think we're all dancing around this question of trying to look into the crystal ball. So uh, Nikki points out that uh, we've heard from employee, employees who want to be in the office and miss it. They are looking to rebuild relationships and a WeWork environment makes this makes it a little difficult. And employees want some sort of their quote unquote own space, but do want to work from home 30 to 50% of the time. So here's this interesting survey and information coming out of Northwest Natural we're hearing about, hey, how much do they want to be at home? How much do they want to be in the workplace? And then Trisha is teeing up this similar question uh, that I think is to me the most important one. With all this learned um, behavior around COVID about isolating and keeping six feet apart, are we gonna shift in deeper into we work collaborative open bullpen style design or are we going to go back to the old days of being in our closed door offices to provide that separation? Have we learned that behavior or are we going to come out of this and say, we just want to be surrounded with people and have that opportunity to understand Andrew Colas's sarcasm expressions directly. So this is to all of our panelists and thank you so much to Tricia and to Nikki. Well, I'm happy to, I'm sorry, Matt, oh, you go first. What we're seeing, um, and, and this ties, but this ties directly into Matt's business actually, is that tenants are not necessarily looking for the closed door model, but they have no desire at all to get into a we work type model. They want to be able to come back to their own desk, clean it themselves, and know that they're the person that occupies that space. But what we are seeing is that an open environment works to the degree that the cubes are big enough and have some separation. So it's, it's up, up, uh, up to people like Matt to design those kind of spaces that people are comfortable in, um, but they occupy them on their own. That's what I was gonna say. Do you want a job, Vanessa? <laughs> No, just to add on that, I agree 100%. And if you look at uh, flexibility, the opposite of that is closed door offices. So, and the people that are in those offices are usually the ones traveling or in meetings, and they're the most un underutilized, you know, asset on the floor. You know, really what we're looking at, it's not a debate between open and closed, but it's how do you support people in the different work functions, and every company has a different answer. So if you think about there's, you need a place for heads down concentration, you need a place for collaboration, you need a place to socialize, you need a place to have formal meetings. You know, that's how we really create an ecosystem that 
it, again, it's going to be different from each for each company. And then add a fifth to that, it's going to be working from home. So really, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be kind of dynamic, we think. Um, and further on the closed door and the lack of flexibility, we're seeing a huge uptick in pods. So modular construction, uh, I don't know what, Andrew, what you're seeing with that, uh, hi highly flexible, but pods, uh, you can, even if you have two years left on your lease, you can put a conference room in and then pack it up and take it with you to the next place. So I think flexibility, whether it's open or closed, is going to continue be, to be the trend. Yeah, I, I, I just build on um, what both Vanessa and Matt said. Um, it, it's been it, interesting in our, our business, we've always kind of had to have that. Um, you, you have the spaces set up, so your project managers, your estimators, your accountants, your, you, you know, your overall overhead teams, they have their set spaces. But then you have people in construction when we have a big project that they go to a remote job and they're on the job. And so you kind of have that flexibility of these are the spaces for project managers. When you come back, this will be your space, but it may be over here. So you have that flexibility. I completely agree with Vanessa. You don't, our employees don't want to come in every day and have a new space, right? And so um, to the other part of that question, uh, people wanting to maybe work remotely 50% of the time, I think that's going to be something that we all have to look at over the long term and really think about, uh, to, to Vanessa's point, the growth of the millennials. And I, I think that a lot of millennials will tell you that I want to have that flexibility of working 50% of the time and you're, you're gonna have to be able to adapt your, your, your whole system to accommodate in ways. But I think it's also about educating uh, the, the people that are coming into the workforce, how important it is to really grow and foster relationships within being able to climb the corporate ladders. Uh, I think that's going to be specifically important uh, in education as we've also gone through this whole uh, social uh, awareness. Well, hopefully people have gone through social awareness in the last six months of uh, the, the, the huge disparities of people of color in leadership positions. So again, it's really hard to build and foster relationships in Zoom meetings. And I think responsible employers are going to continue to want to encourage people to come into the office and encourage them the reason why you want to come into the office and the reason why you want to build relationships with an Andrew Hone or a Vanessa or whoever it may be within your company because you glean information that otherwise you would not have access to. So I think it's going to be really important for leaders of responsible companies to accommodate as best as you can to the people within your company, while also understanding if, if we really want to, there's a lot of things that we were, we're adjusting, right? COVID's had this huge impact on us. And then we've also had kind of a social movement where we're, we're realizing that when you look at the majority of large scale boards, you don't see diversity in those boards, right? You don't see representation in those boards. You see it at the leader, leadership structures of most companies. I don't truly believe that that's going to change if everybody is working remotely. So I think responsible employers have to understand that and have to educate the millennials as to why it's important to come into the office and also have the flexibility so that at times you don't. I think in, in my business, our estimators, there's, there's ebbs and flows. Sometimes we have three big estimates. It may be better for them to be able to work at home and not have anybody distracting or bother, bothering them so we have good systems and good setups for them so that they can remote remote work remotely but there's a lot of things that we're all going to have to continue to learn as we come out of the cycle that's great and i just um i want to do a quick follow-up here uh this uh next question is for amanda howell specifically uh from of course the university of oregon urbanism next from amanda s who's at pge and mentioned uh in your remarks earlier uh amanda howell that uh there, you've been seeing acceleration in trends over the last six months. So you mentioned bike sales and a few other things, but are there other trends that you're seeing that are driving uh, forces that you can identify for Amanda S? Other trends that we should be aware of that are developing currently? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I think just the top of mind for me in terms of the research that I'm doing right now is really around 
the extreme growth of delivery. Um, we obviously were ordering more and more online before the pandemic, but I think as people, you know, shifted to being at home more, um, you know, trying to social distance and, and some, you know, concerns about being in public spaces and going to the store, we have seen, I think, that those numbers just kind of go through, like, go through the roof um, in the last few months. And a big shift has been, you know, I think before the pandemic, there were a, a lot of goods that we were already, you know, comfortable buying online, a lot of um, electronics and clothing and things that we were kind of already starting to shift in that direction. But I think in the last six months, this huge shift towards being willing to try grocery online delivery or pickup has been, you know, that, that we've seen record adoption of that, record downloads of Instacart, um, and then also, of course, the meal delivery and using the apps for like Uber Eats and um, Caviar and, and those kinds of those apps. And so, you know, I think that there are so many implications for that, for our built environment and our communities about what this means when we're shifting towards ordering more and more to be delivered to us. Um, and I think, you know, what that means for our retail and our restaurant spaces, you know, uh, Andrew mentioned this sort of the um, move towards, we've been calling them sort of these ghost kitchens. Uh, that's, that's one term, but yeah, these, these online order delivery shared kitchen spaces where, you know, you can't actually go in and sit down um, or maybe sit outside of it. Um, they were already, you know, we were already starting to kind of see an interest in this space. And I think overnight, as a result of COVID, restaurants, you know, across Portland sort of had to adopt this model where they largely became delivery only, at least temporarily, or pickup only. Um, you know, now with the open streets initiatives and stuff, outdoor dining, we've, you know, there's been a little, some of that business has been able to re return. But, you know, I think that that's going to be something to watch, absolutely, um, and what that means for our retail spaces, including grocery stores, and, you know, the amount of parking and the idea that we really, you know, we will shift more towards pickup and delivery, then we will going and spending a lot of time in these places. I, I think we will see that change. Well, thank you for that. And I, that is about all the time that we have today. And I know that we could talk about this for much longer, but I, I, just in reflecting on what I've heard today, all of you, all of our panelists are engaged in an industry that thinks very long-term and the built environment requires long-term investment here we are in this moment of complete short-term consideration and hearing the way that all of you are adapting and that your industry has moved and the trends that we're following uh, i just want to commend each of you for being able to pivot the way that you do uh, for being leaders in our business community and for taking the time out to help educate our members about what it is that we should all be thinking about because this is really going to impact everything from how we are uh, experiencing culture within our own office spaces and i really like that interplay of the human element with the built environments. So uh, for all of you out there, please give a massive digital round of applause to this remarkably talented panel. Um, I'm giving you my, that's actually, that's live applause. Uh, there, you can hear it there. I just clapped for you. So um, my hats are off to all of you and thank you so much for joining us today. To all of those who joined us virtually speaking, thank you for taking the time to be a part of our panel. Next up, November 18th, uh, it will be called the Hangover Forum because it will be post-election and we'll either be celebrating or, or I don't know what, detoxing or, or just crying, <laughs> uh, whatever. There'll be some sort of emotional response, I assure you. So mark your calendars, November 18th, 10 a.m., right back here on this strange looking screen with all of you and uh, everyone stay safe. Don't forget to vote and continue to be connected. Be well, everybody, thanks again.